Here's what I think is the most effective leg day I've ever designed using scientific principles. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here today, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching breaking down the most effective leg day I can possibly design. Before we go into the actual leg day, let me break down what makes a session effective for muscle growth. There's a few important things to know here. The first is that your session needs to fit within your program. The best leg day does nothing if your program as a whole does not make sense. Even if I design the best leg day possible for you right now, but you only did it once a year as part of your program, it wouldn't be that great. Conversely, if I gave you a super difficult leg day, but your program had you doing it six times a week, it wouldn't be that good. And so in line with that, this session is designed to be a pretty hard leg day, performed two to three times a week with some variations and exercise selection and the focus placed on different muscle groups. In this case, this leg day will have a slight quad emphasis, but hit your overall lower body very effectively. If you didn't want to run this as part of an upper lower or push pull leg sort of split, but instead wanted to turn this into a full body session, split up this session across two days instead. For instance, on one day, you could do the lower body compounds alongside the upper body isolation work, and on the other day, you could do the upper body compounds with a lower body isolation work. In general, this will be a hard session, and leg days are going to be hard, and that's why I generally prefer a full body approach nowadays. By splitting up that leg work across the week a little bit more, it just makes each session more manageable. This leg day is closer to something you do twice a week versus even three times a week. So if you train your legs three times a week, feel free to remove some of the exercises and split them across three days instead. One hallmark of good session design is limiting redundancy. So essentially making sure that you're not just doing the same thing over and over again. With each additional set that is very similar to the previous one, in terms of the movement pattern being trained, in terms of the muscle group being trained, we are getting diminishing returns. For instance, an older meta-analysis by Krieger and colleagues on volume found this. Likewise, because we want to train most muscle groups at least twice a week, just training your quads on one leg day and just training your hamstrings on the second leg day isn't making the most of your training time. For instance, if you did squats, the hack squats, and then a lunging pattern in the same session, that is going to be a great stimulus for your quadriceps, for the most part, your glutes and your adductors, but your hamstrings are getting essentially no love. So a good leg day is going to have a good distribution of different body parts. Next up, we want to be using maximally effective rep ranges. What does that mean? Well, the hypertrophy rep range is really as wide as five reps per set, to 50 reps per set. However, for practicality reasons, and in order to ensure that we're pretty accurate at gauging how close to failure we are, we'll want to use mostly sets of 5 to 15. A scoping review performed by our own group found that people are generally pretty accurate at gauging how close to failure they are until the rep range gets to be above 12 reps or so. However, some data also suggests that using a variety of rep ranges within your program leads to a bit more hypertrophy, potentially, than just using one. So a good session will incorporate some variety of rep ranges. And at the very least, across the training week, we'll try and train most muscle groups through a variety of rep ranges, mostly in the 5 to 15 rep range, but all the way to 30 reps pretty often. Additionally, in this specific example, super high reps on compound lower body training are relatively silly. You've probably heard of doing sets of 20 reps on squats. I would not recommend that. In most situations and most examples that I've seen of people doing this, they end that set of squats, not because their quads or glutes or adductors were particularly close to failure, but just because they really wanted to get out from underneath that board. It's a miserable experience, and I think you'd be better served going a little bit heavier on the compound movements and a little bit lighter on the isolation movements. Next, we'll want to make sure we're using a maximally effective per session training volume. That is going to be somewhere between about five to 15 sets per session per muscle based on the most recent meta-analyses by Basval and colleagues and Schoenfeld and colleagues, assuming you train most muscle groups twice to three times a week. At the top end of that range of 15 sets per session per muscle, if you train that muscle twice or three times a week with that volume, that is going to result in a volume of about 30 to 45 sets. Based on some more recent research, eight studies comparing volumes in excess of 20 sets per week per muscle to lower volumes of below 20 sets per week per muscle, four studies find a benefit in favor of these higher volumes and four find no difference. If you want a whole podcast episode on that, check out the Strong by Science podcast we did. But to make a long story short, when you're specializing or when you really want to maximize growth in an area, those high volumes might be beneficial. And so a range of five to 15 sets per session per muscle 
is going to get you somewhere between a solid hypertrophy stimulus to a maximum hypertrophy stimulus across the week. Next, for ultimate leg day, we we'll want to make sure we're taking each set to a maximally effective relative intensity or proximity to failure. And generally, we'll take the earlier sets within that session a little bit further than failure and the later sets a little bit closer to failure. On average, the closer you take a set to failure, the more hypertrophy it produces. But if we go to failure on every set within that session, the performance at the start of the session might be decent, but the fatigue from doing so will catch up with us and limit performance on subsequent sets and exercises. And so, to maintain a good level of performance across the session, which might be important for overall hypertrophy, we're going to be varying the proximity to failure a little bit across sets and exercises. Next, we'll want to pick maximally effective exercises for each muscle group we're training. I have a whole series on that very topic, and I'll have some videos in the description for the quadriceps, hamstrings, glutes, calves as well. But to give you a quick overview of what good exercises have in common for hypertrophy, here's what they do. First, they target one of the primary functions of the target muscle. That target muscle should also be the limiting factor within the exercise. The exercise should be stretch friendly, meaning that you can get a good stretch in the target muscle group, there's plenty of tension in that position, and ideally, the exercise is length and partial friendly. Where possible, we want to avoid exercises that load the spine or other muscle groups unnecessarily. And finally, ideally, especially for people who are low on time, it should be a time efficient exercise that doesn't require a ton of setup. We'll also want to make sure that we're picking the maximally effective rest times between sets. Ultimately, with rest times, you do have some wiggle room. If you rest for less long between sets, the potency of each set becomes reduced and you'll need to do more sets to make up for it. I have a whole video on the topic here that you can check out, but generally for lower body training, we'll definitely want to rest for at least one minute between sets and often at least two minutes between sets. In my own experience, with hard sets of squats or RDLs or what have you, my own rest times often need to be as high as three to six minutes between sets. Ultimately, I think that a good way to auto-regulate rest duration between sets is going to be paying attention to your performance. If you're able to get a similar performance from set to set, the rest between those two sets was likely sufficient. Next, exercise order isn't really important for hypertrophy. In fact, a recent meta-analysis by Nunes and colleagues found exactly this. But generally, on a principled level, I personally order exercises in the following way, just to be safe. I'll start with exercises that are more important to us. For example, if you're specializing on your quadriceps, maybe start with those exercises first. We may also want to order exercises in a way that maximizes performance across the session. If, for example, you start with leg extensions before doing your squats, you might find that your squats take a relatively big hit in terms of performance. However, if you switch the order, you may find that squatting before doing leg extensions doesn't impact leg extension performance at all or all that much. And generally, it may or may not be a good idea to order exercises in a fashion that allows you to maximize performance. Finally, as a good rule of thumb, I think it's worth putting compound exercises first within the session, all else being equal. And the final component of the ultimate leg day is to use a good technique on all exercises. There are three to four components of good technique as identified in our recent review paper on exactly this topic for muscle building. First, we want to emphasize long muscle lengths. Whatever range of motion you use, make sure you get a full stretch. This could be a full range of motion, or this could be lengthened partials. Second, we'll want to avoid using momentum from other joints to lift the weight. We'll want to use a technique that essentially maximizes the odds of the target muscle being the limiting factor. Third, we'll want to have some eccentric control with the reps taking between two and eight seconds on average. There may be a slight benefit to be had by controlling the eccentric a little bit more and being a bit more explosive on the concentric or lifting phase. And finally, putting aside these three factors, if there's a certain technique that you prefer using, by all means, go ahead. And if a certain technique causes you pain, but another one doesn't, and they both are reasonably similar in terms of how they achieve range of motion, tempo, and momentum, go for the technique that's less painful. And without further ado, based on all of these criteria that I think make up a really solid hypertrophy session for the legs, here's the best leg day I could possibly design. Keep in mind, this is for a slightly quad biased leg day. First, we'll start with a squat pattern to hit the quads, adductors, and glutes. Now, none of these get a complete stimulus. For the quads, the rectus femoris likely doesn't get trained that well. For the glutes, the glute medius and minimus don't get trained very well. And for the adductors, the adductor brevis and longus that don't contribute to hip extension also don't get trained very well. But a squat pattern provides a really solid stimulus for the knee extensor muscles by and large and the hip extensor muscles by and large. We'll be performing either the high bar squat with a full range of motion or the Smith machine squat, either with full range of motion or length and partials. Dealer's choice. We'll be performing two to four sets of five to eight repetitions, taking the first set to about three repetitions in reserve and the last set to about one repetition in reserve. Between sets, we'll take between two and six minutes of rest. 
however much rest you find you need to roughly maintain performance set to set. Both of these exercises load the stretch position very well, and specifically, Smith Machine Length and Partials are brutal. Using the Smith Machine makes it easier and safer to push close to failure. Personally, I wouldn't do Length and Partials on a regular squat. If you're going to be doing the high bar squat, just use a full range of motion, pausing at the very bottom. Importantly, most of the data we have on the stretch position being really important for hypertrophy and Length and Partials potentially being beneficial is actually in the lower body and specifically in the quadriceps. So don't skimp on the lengthened position. In my opinion and my experience, low rep ranges are best for squatting variation. If you go too high in reps, like those 20 rep squats I mentioned earlier, you will likely find yourself ending the set not because of the quads, but because you're out of breath. Once we've done the squats, we'll be moving on to a hip hinge pattern to target the hamstrings, the glutes, and the adductors. Once again, certain smaller muscles within these categories won't be hit perfectly, but we'll be coming back to those later. I personally recommend the Dumbbell Romanian Deadlift or even the Smith Machine Good Morning for this exercise category. We'll be performing two to four sets of eight to 12 repetitions, taking the first set to about three repetitions in reserve, and the last set, one repetition from failure. I recommend a rest time of about two to five minutes between sets, but once again, let your performance dictate your rest time. On this exercise, I recommend doing partials. Whether you're doing RDLs or good mornings, you may actually want to do lengthen partials to increase hypertrophy even further. And we have a study that hasn't been published yet by my OA colleagues, the same group of researchers that also did the seated leg curl versus lying leg curl study and the overhead extension versus pushdown study that compared a lengthened partial on the multi-hip machine to a full range of motion. A multi-hip machine with a knee relatively extended is a similar movement pattern to an RDL or any sort of hip hinge for the hamstrings, really. They found about twice as much hypertrophy in the hip extensors collectively when doing lengthened partials as compared to a full range of motion. And so I think doing lengthened partials on your hip hinge here is a good option. This exercise will target the hamstrings minus the short head of the hamstrings that only does knee flexion, the glutes minus the gluteus medius and minimus that do not contribute to hip extension, and the adductors minus the brevis and longus that don't contribute to hip extension either. Next up, to get some more stimulus for the quads and hamstrings as a whole, but specifically to target the rectus femoris and the short head of the hamstrings, will be supersetting two exercises. I recommend doing the seated leg curl and the reverse Nordic curl as a superset. You'll be doing two to three sets of 12 to 20 reps on the seated leg curl and two to three sets of as many reps as possible on the reverse Nordic curl. On both of these exercises, take the first set to about one rep from failure and the last set all the way to failure. Because you'll be supersetting, I recommend taking about one to three minutes of rest between sets for the same exercise. While you're doing the reverse Nordic curl, for example, your hamstrings are essentially resting. And so this superset can allow you to save time. Equally, if you don't have time constraints, feel free to do them separately. Alternatively, if you don't have these machines available or you don't like the reverse Nordic curl, feel free to switch out the seated leg curl for the lying leg curl and the reverse Nordic curl for either a sissy squat or even the leg extension. The leg extension probably won't be as good, but that's my take. The reason I recommended the seated leg curl and the reverse Nordic curl specifically is as follows. One, we have a study by my own colleagues directly comparing the seated leg curl to the lying leg curl, generally finding better hypertrophy of the hamstrings in the seated leg curl. And two, we have a study that's as of yet unpublished that I'm involved in, looking at the effects of hip flexion angle during the leg extension on hypertrophy of the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis. While we found similar hypertrophy of the vastus lateralis no matter the hip flexion angle, we found substantially greater hypertrophy of the rectus femoris overall when your hips were more extended, as would be the case during a reverse Nordic curl compared to a leg extension. And so both of these exercises, the seated leg curl and the reverse Nordic curl, take great advantage of the stretch position to potentially cause more muscle growth. And again, if you are literally made of time, you can not superset these. But for me, I'll be supersetting them and getting straight back to the studio, hashtag grindset. The remainder of the exercises within this session are relatively optional, depending on your goals, how often you train your legs, and so forth. But here's the full list of exercises. The next couple exercises I would do in a good leg day that I'd perform twice a week would be a superset of the hip abduction and hip adduction machine. These two exercises round out the stimulus that your adductors and glutes get. The adductor brevis and longus and the gluteus medius and minimus don't get trained well during the hip extension exercises performed earlier. Perform two to three sets of 12 to 20 reps on both of these machines. Take the first set on these exercises to one rep in reserve and the last set to failure. You likely won't need to rest for much longer than about 45 seconds to 90 seconds between two sets for the same exercise. Listen, if you do choose to do this, just keep in mind, they're positioned right next to each other for a reason. They are literally made to superset. Big Jim wants you to superset these two exercises. 
don't disappoint me. In all likelihood, by this point in the session, you'll be sufficiently warmed up that you can just do one warm up set and get ready to go. Because your adductor magnus and your gluteus maximus are both also involved in these functions performed during these exercises, but they're also hip extensors, leaning forward during these exercises increases the stretch on these two muscle groups even more, potentially causing more hypertrophy. Try it out. If you're looking to maximize overall lower body size, I do think you should be training your hip adductors and adductors at least once a week, so that's why I'm including it here. And for what it's worth, my legs have never looked bigger than now when I've been training my hip adductors at least once a week. It just contributes to overall teardrop shape of the leg. And the final optional superset is a superset of a calf exercise with an ab exercise. Neither of these muscle groups got a lot of love during the session, but if you want to maximize calf and ab growth, do them. Perform two to four sets of five to 10 repetitions and as many reps as possible on the leg press calf raise and ab wheel rollout respectively. Because these are two isolation exercises with no overlapping musculature, you likely won't need more than about 45 to 90 seconds of rest between two sets for the same exercise. If you don't have an ab wheel like myself, just grab a preloaded barbell and you're ready to go. If you're strong, consider standing up and that will make the exercise a lot more challenging. If you're weak like me, consider kneeling down instead. I recommend the leg press calf raise as an exercise for time efficiency. It's plug and play, you select the load, you lift the load, congratulations, you've trained your calves. Additionally, I recommend a calf raise variation with your knees extended as opposed to flexed, because we do have a couple studies comparing the seated calf raise to standing calf raise, generally finding better hypertrophy of the gastroc in the standing calf raise, and similar-ish soleus hypertrophy. That's a study by Kinoshida and colleagues and a study out of our own lab that we haven't published yet. Likewise, you may want to consider length and partials as a recent study by Cassiano and colleagues comparing length and partials to short and partials to a full range of motion found the best hypertrophy following length and partials. Length and partials being approximately half reps. Why the ab wheel rollout is an ab exercise? Well, while it doesn't fully stretch out the abs in terms of positioning, it does provide the most tension on the abs when your abs are relatively lengthened at the bottom of that rep. Or you could just do cable crunches or machine crunches. Now let's go through a checklist to see whether or not our session is optimally effective. First, by training a variety of movement patterns, we are limiting redundancy. Second, we are training through a variety of rep ranges and generally between five and 50 with a bias towards the five to 15 rep range. Third, most of the muscle groups, minus some of the smaller ones that may not be quite as important for overall aesthetics, are being trained with between five and 15 sets in the session. Fourth, we're generally taking each set relatively close to failure, going a little bit further from failure as we're starting the session and on more compound movements, and generally going closer to failure as we get towards the latter sets of an exercise and the latter sets of the session. We've picked maximally effective exercises for each muscle group, focusing on the few components that make an exercise effective. We also have picked maximally effective rest times by resting for at least 60 seconds between sets, closer to two minutes for most things, and generally letting performance dictate how long we rest. While exercise order isn't very important, we generally place the more compound exercises with the higher overall yields on physique earlier in the session. And finally, as you'll have seen throughout this video, we have used good technique, making sure to focus on the stretch position through the tempo, having a sufficiently slow eccentric, generally a rep duration of between two and eight seconds with an explosive concentric, and making sure that the target muscle group is the limiting factor by minimizing body English. And that is the video. Broke down a whole leg day that I think is honestly the most effective leg day I've ever designed. If you do a similar leg day to this twice a week, with some slight variations from day to day, maybe placing more of a hamstring emphasis on that second day, maybe removing some of the hip abduction and adduction exercises, because you've already trained those once in the week, you've got yourself a super effective leg routine that you can repeat week upon week. This session gave you a complete stimulus for literally all of the musculature in the lower body, besides maybe the tibialis anterior. If you enjoyed this leg day, please like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what other muscle groups you want to see me break down the best session for. I know like half of you aren't subscribed. If you enjoyed the video, please do consider subscribing. Hit the bell as well so that you get notified when I release a new video. If you'd like me to coach you and design your program with many of these super effective sessions so that you can grow a bunch of muscle, consider checking out the link above and I could become your coach. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.